thank you all for having us here. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity. And I will say, I appreciate what you guys do because when Eddie first mentioned us being asked to, to do this, um, the only experience I'd had with Kimpac, and it was just a few weeks prior to this, was a licensure application uh, for Prattville. I live in Prattville. And the hospital is remodeling, and they're wanting to relocate it to the public safety building there. I was like, okay, move it. I don't care. Why, why do you want a license from us? Well, I start looking into it, and uh, then I come here and hear all of this is, is pretty, it's, it's interesting, to say the least. Uh, you guys do a great job. Uh, I'll give kudos to public health. You guys got some good information out, out on the Internet. Uh, as far as preparation, uh, good tools, um, and then just the conversations we've we've heard here uh, today. Um, and I can only imagine the talks yesterday. We couldn't make it down until late yesterday, but um, it's very interesting. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. Um, our objectives today, we're going to discuss, as Eddie said, uh, some ways you can uh, prepare for, prevent burglaries, uh, prepare for robberies. Um, and we'll touch on preparing for disasters. Uh, you guys have been, you, you guys are the experts. And I, I will say this, when this was first brought up about us speaking, um, I racked my brain. Uh, Eddie and I were going to we're going to put these slides together. We were going to work on it together, and of course, you know how that goes. He's pulled one direction. I'm pulled one direction. Um, Eddie's in the office most of the time. I'm not, so it, it was really difficult. So I, I I get online. I'm trying to, and I was really struggling with with what to put together, um, and I had. Something but, you, put but, to, but you did a great job. Oh, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, just remember that when it comes to raise time. Yes, sir. Um, but um, you know, I finally just told Eddie. I just I just sat back in my in my office chair and I said, I'm trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're going to be speaking to people who deal with this every day. There's nothing we can tell them from from the perspective of preparing for emergencies that they don't already know. In fact, they can educate us. But anyway, needless to say, I scrapped that. Um, I just started, started from scratch. But um, so we'll just touch on the, the disaster aspect of it. Uh, so I know there's, there's a couple of items in here. I know you guys have heard a million times already. Um, and then we'll discuss our, our role, the board's role, uh, in, in disaster events. We're going to echo what Rhonda said pretty much. I mean, uh, you know, you've got to have a plan. There has to be a plan, uh, a disaster plan, a plan for, for preparing for these type of incidents, these type of crimes. Um, my first experience of when um, I knew nobody had a plan was I was a detective sergeant with the Hoover Police Department. We were investigating a homicide. We, me and my partner were actually interviewing a suspect in that, in that crime. And um, we'd been in the interview room. We, we used to call them interrogation room, no, no, the interview room. So we were talking to the suspect and my lieutenant comes and knocks on the door and says, hey, you guys got to get out of here. There's a storm coming. They say it's going to be bad. That was 1993. Snowstorm, of not, blizzard of 1993. So I get home. I end up having 23 inches of snow in my backyard. Luckily, I had a gas grill. 
Luckily, I had uh, firewood that I just bought that weekend before, uh, which was kind of silly because, as all of you that remember it know, it was in April when it happened. And, um, and so that's when I realized the city of Birmingham didn't have a plan, the city of Hoover didn't have a plan, the Department of Transportation didn't have a plan for a snow blizzard. So people were trapped. First responders couldn't get to people. You know, nobody had four-wheel drive vehicles then. You know, nobody had the number of sand trucks that they have today. Nobody had any type of equipment to scrape the roads. Well, we learned from that experience. I mean, all first responders, all people that are involved, the EMA, I'm sure everybody, because you know how it is in Alabama. Nobody knows how to drive when it snows. So, um, but that was the first time I, I said to myself, nobody's got a plan here. So. The only reason you bought that firewood is because you're cheap. You it was a, cheaper. You got a <laughs> discount in April. Um, anyway, um, the first thing we hear when, when a uh, burglary occurs, we get the phone call. Uh, in fact, this just happened to me a couple of months ago. And first thing you hear is, hey, we were robbed. Well, my first question is, is everybody okay? Oh, yeah, we're fine. Nobody was here. I said, well, you told me you were robbed. Well, yeah, they broke in while we were, you know, overnight. Pharmacy was closed. Well, it's not a robbery. It's a burglary. And, and it drives me crazy, but it's just one of those things. That's but, the cops. Then, that's what they have yeah. Um, but anyway, burglary involves unlawful entering or remaining uh, in, a, in a building with the intent to take property or commit a crime. So robbery, of course, involves use of force or threat of force uh, taking property from another. So. There is a difference. We try to, Rhonda and I, we, we do a CE, and she normally handles the this aspect of it, but I decided to, to throw it in here today with ours. But, um, and, and our audience is normally all pharmacists or pharmacists and technicians, pharmacy technicians. But um, anyway, we just try to get the word out so they can, uh, in fact, I have a, a slide in here later on. Uh, actually shows a robbery suspect, a guy who robbed a pharmacy in Montgomery. First thing in preparing uh, for burglaries, um, I want to look to the, the physical security of your building. And while I was doing this, of course it hits me, well, you can prepare your pharmacy for a burglary while at the same time that can also serve a dual purpose security to prevent burglaries and for uh, securing your building in the event of, of a natural disaster, say a hurricane, tornado, whatnot. Uh, if you have certain, certain items on your building, then you can prevent your windows from being smashed or uh, if there's the event of a riot, someone mentioned, it may have been Rhonda mentioned earlier, uh, if you have certain protective uh, equipment, such as roll down steel curtains uh, for the windows, or uh, there's actually a window coating a film you can have put on your windows that uh, will help. Uh, it's harder to get through. Um, and I try not to use commercial names, but uh, you can YouTube, check, you know, search YouTube and find uh, s protective window film, and there, there's videos that really just blow your mind at what it takes to get through that. Um, doors, windows, lighting, and bollards, as someone mentioned, uh, Eddie mentioned uh, just, just a moment ago, uh, the poles that are out in front of your building uh, can prevent someone from driving a vehicle through uh, into your pharmacy. Also, Keep little old ladies from 
accidentally hitting the gas when they should hit the brake like they did at the gas station near my house where I stop every morning for coffee. Um, alarm systems, surveillance cameras, and lighting. Um, alarm systems, if your pharmacy is closed during a disaster or even if it's just closed at night, uh, this is going to provide uh, um, 24 hour monitoring. Um, the cameras are going to get good video. Hopefully, we still have some pharmacies who like to use the grainy, black and white. You can't tell anything, and I try to get it across to them. The better your video equipment, the better chance of, of catching the people who do it. Uh, lighting, I've heard pros and cons. I say leave some lights on. Others say, why do you want to let them uh, be able to see what they're doing in their pharmacy? They, these people are going to, if they get in, they're going to find a way. They're going to be able to see. They bring their own flashlights, so or they'll just flip the lights on. They really don't care. They're in and out so fast, it'll yeah, we, make your head spin. We've got video of them coming in. They're looking at their watch. They're in and out of there in three minutes. They know that's going to be how long it's going to take for the alarm company to be notified, for the alarm company to contact the police department, for the police department dispatch to contact the police out on the field and to get to that pharmacy. So they know three minutes they got to be in and out. So we have a gang right now of, of burglars that are hitting um, up and down I-10 and up and down I-65. And um, like I said, this. I just had a discussion with the uh, asset protection loss prevention uh, management because they they because of this ability to get through their drive-through window and it's, it's um, creating an easy pathway for uh, them to get inside and so this chain is the only chain they're hitting like that and uh, so they are working towards reinforcing that area and changing the design of the drive-through window to to protect that. Um, you know, we also say, you know, on alarm systems, you know, uh, a lot of burglars now are realizing they can cut the cord, the the uh, phone lines outside if it's still being used with a landline. So we recommend cellular uh, connections on that. And on that same, the, uh, as far as alarm systems, I had a. It's been a few years now. One of my pharmacies in Prattville was burglarized. Uh, I had the video start to finish, and like Eddie mentioned, they checked their watches. Um, you can see from their drive-through, and this was an independent pharmacy, you can see from the drive-through windows, you see two vehicles pass by, and then they circle around, apparently, the block, and then you see them come back, it's the same vehicle. Um, only one pulls in, we assume the other was a lookout. They pull up to the front door, use a pry bar, uh, and this was the, I know you know the doors I'm, I'm talking about, pretty much like the sliding doors you see at a Walmart or Walgreens, uh, metal, metal frame with the glass in it. They, it took them two seconds or less to pop that open um, in and out in a minute and a half and that was they brought their own uh, Rubbermaid tote uh, went in it was just a quick cursory search but they knew what they wanted raked it in the, the tote and they were gone and that's with a you get a factor in a 45 second delay for the alarm to go off because that's the delay they had set to allow the employee time to come in. Um, goes to the alarm company, then they have to, and they also timed, these people study this just like you guys are here learning or training on emergency preparedness. Uh, not all of them just get out of bed and decide to break into a pharmacy. Um, they, they had it timed, they had it down pat, they did it during shift change for the police department. So, uh, and the fire department's directly across the street. So, and they still, they still got away. Um, anyway, the, the, alarm, the alarms provide the 24-hour 
uh, monitoring and a timeline of the events. That's not burglary preparation. A little air horn tape to the wall. I like to, you laugh. I had a pharmacist call me and I would, let's just say, I'll say just, I cover, a, I cover southeast Alabama, so let's just say in, my, in the southern portion of my territory. Um, calls me up, tells me, he actually got it right. He said, he, well, he just said they, we got broken into. So what happened? He said, man, they cleaned me out. What happened? Well, I had a new door installed on the back. Okay. Well, and there's a long pause. He said, well, bless you. They, uh, the guy had to install it, put the hinges on the outside. So they just popped the hinges off, took the door off, and walked in. So, um, sounds like an inside job. It was outside. <laughs> well, uh, and this is still window curtains I mentioned. Uh, still door curtains, same thing. The, the roll down, kind of like the old garage door type uh, type things. Uh, and they they latch, and it's not. None of this is. Foolproof. I mean, th th these guys are going to get in if they want to get in, uh, but nothing else. Slow them down uh, until hopefully the alarm goes off. Give give law enforcement a little more time to get there. Uh, and Rhonda mentioned this: an interior safe for controlled substances. Um, I have pharmacies who have the the big heavy safes bolted to the floor. Uh, while they're open for business, they take the trays out and put them on the shelf uh, during business hours. And at night, they lock them up. Uh, some of them, some very few, but some have gone to the extreme and have put a second uh, alarm to the safe. Just kind of a, give you an idea of the bollards. Uh, video surveillance. Uh, have it visible where, the, where these people can see it because they, they have guys or people come in, uh, case the place out. Uh, they see the video recording, trying to, trying to let it serve as a deterrent. Uh, post signs, not saying all these clowns can read, but it might, it might, it might help in, in some form or fashion. Uh, and the drive-through window camera, not all of our places have this. But, uh, Eddie, correct me if I'm wrong, I think these Walgreens break-ins, they've been coming in through the drive through window. Now I wasn't going to tell them who it was. Uh, I wasn't going to tell them who it was. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> Maybe they can help. <laughs> no, well, I, I heard they had some pull with them, so anyway. I think Rhonda may have mentioned this as well, and I'm a big proponent of it. Uh, invite your local police to your pharmacy to do a security assessment. And I, I had eight years at Montgomery Police Department and I worked a year at Pelham Police Department. And I'm not saying I'm an, a security expert, but I've seen enough break-ins that I can tell you the things we're telling you here are going to help. And then just be aware of suspicious activity, people hanging around, people you don't know, asking strange questions. They very well could be trying to see uh, where you go to to pick up a bottle of, I don't know, hydrocodone to fill a prescription or Oxycontin. This guy here, this was in Montgomery, then two, two three years ago. Uh, he walks into Gulf States Distributors, any, any of you guys are familiar with that place, a, they sell police gear, guns, uh, walks to the back, you know, he's just Joe Blow, average customer, looking around, picks up, they, they used to keep guns out on the, on the table that were consignment sales, if they had a department that turned in guns. Or, um, anyway, he picks a gun up and runs to the front door, he's gone. They chase, chase after him, couldn't catch him. 
He goes down the street, robs a gas station. He also robbed one of my pharmacies. Um, fortunately, no one was injured, but the call I got was, hey, our store just got robbed. You know, I asked if everything was okay. He said, he said, yes, I'm not there. I said, what do you mean you're not there? Oh, I'm in Atlanta. So, well, what? Oh, they called me from the store. Now, I guess everybody's okay. They seemed they were just a little shaken up. But they caught the guy eventually. Uh, of course, he had several felony charges on him. Um, but you just never, never know how, how these things are going to happen. And it doesn't have to be a knife or a gun. This clown here threatened to blow up the place uh, in Dothan if they didn't give her drugs. The opioid abuse problem out there, I mean, there's people who are desperate for drugs and, and, and as much as we're trying to curtail the illegal drugs out there, I know uh, state and local law enforcement is trying to fight the, the heroin epidemic, but people go to great, great extremes to try to get, get their drugs. And on the note of being aware, uh, this... Uh, store manager, assistant manager that, that noticed, noticed that young lady uh, in the store. And uh, anyway, they, they wound up catching her at, at a different location, but nonetheless, she was charged with uh, robbery, attempted robbery. Just be aware, get to know your beat officers, like I mentioned earlier, uh, ask them to come by. If, if you make coffee, ask them if they want a cup of coffee, anything to get them in your store. Uh, the, more, the more you got the police around, uh, the less likely you're going to have any problems. Uh, and don't be afraid to call them. Police officers, I, I will say some of them are cocky and arrogant and you don't really want to talk to them. But for the most part, they're, they're nice guys. They're just like all of us here, uh, very approachable. Um, and willing to help, uh, advice, w whatever you need. Um, and along with that, maybe see if you can get somebody to come by before, you know, when you're opening, when you're closing. Uh, we have had a few incidences where, you know, a pharmacist was locking up, going out his back door, and somebody was, they were waiting on him. Um, we actually had a shooting. Uh, a pharmacist was leaving his independent was leaving his pharmacy in Jefferson County, outside of Birmingham, and they got him out in the parking lot at his car, took him back inside, and he could he wasn't opening uh, the safe fast enough for them, so they shot him twice in both legs. But he recovered and he's doing fine today. But you just never know what someone might do for those drugs. We always say cooperate with them, try to get them in and out of the store as, as, as fast as possible. Try do every do what they tell you to do, but this is one thing I tell people in the the uh, talk that Rhonda and I do is if you if you think if they give you reason to believe that they're going to lay you down on the floor and stand over you and shoot you in the back of the head. Fight, kick, scratch, whatever you have to do. Uh, at that point, it's time to do something. But for the most part, they just want the drugs and they want to get gone before anybody can catch them. So try to give them the drugs, get them what they want, get them out the door. And I'm sure the marshal went over that with you guys with active shooter yesterday. It's the same thing, you know, run, hide, fight. And I know it's a hard thing to do, but try to make mental notes. Uh, you're going to need to give every little detail you can to law enforcement after this happens. Uh, it's, it's funny when, when things like that. I was involved in a, a shooting in Montgomery when I worked there, and I can still remember every vivid detail about that. Uh, 
but yet I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. But that just, it sticks in your mind uh, when you have, have an event like that happen. So uh, just try to be aware of the fact that law enforcement is going to need details. And that's where a good video system comes in uh, to help with uh, identification. Uh, don't try to chase after them. As we said, get them out, get them out as quickly as you can. Um, now we had uh, where where was that at, Eddie? Do you remember the pharmacist that was two guys come in to rob the place? Uh, maybe it was Oklahoma. Uh huh. Two guys come in, rob the pharmacy. Pharmacist reaches behind the counter, pulls out his own handgun, shoots one. He drops to the floor. The other guy takes off running, and the pharmacist just comes out from behind the counter and just keeps shooting at the one that's in the floor. Then he goes back, and he either, I don't recall if he either reloads or gets another gun, comes back and shoots him some more. Well, the pharmacist, at that point, he, he's looking at criminal charges, and, and he was... He was convicted, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, once the threat stopped, you stop shooting yeah, if well, it comes well, to that. When they're trying to get out of there, let them just get out of there. That's what you want to happen. I mean, he incapacitated that first guy with, with his first shot. And all he needed to do, because the other guy ran, get the gun away from the one on the floor, but don't stand there and, and keep shooting. Um, in fact, as to that second point there, uh, don't try to apprehend them. He actually ran to the door to see where the other guy was, as if he wanted to shoot him too while he was running away. Um, all right, disaster preparedness. You guys, like I said, you guys have probably seen it all, heard it all uh, since yesterday. Uh, these are stats I pulled from FEMA, uh, how accurate they are, I couldn't tell you. All I know is I believe that was from 2013. Uh, and that's based on our ranking in Alabama as the seventh in the number of declared disasters for tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, severe storms. Um, but needless to say, those natural disasters can and will affect uh, supply chain for drugs, pharmacies. Uh, I was, I used to be in the, the Army National Guard when Elba flooded, I believe it was 98. Uh, we got sent down there. Uh, and I can only imagine what it was like when Katrina hit. This Elba is very small. We were sent down there just to help, you know, their, their police department's very small. It's a rural area, and we were just there to provide some support for them uh, for about a week. But uh, the whole town was underwater. So, again, I, I can only imagine uh, what it would be like for, and, and I wasn't, I mean, I was here, but the tornado situation in Tuscaloosa, North Alabama, I never actually saw that, any of that for myself, wasn't involved in any of that. But uh, again, planning is key. Scott and I were uh, hired in the same year, 20, 2003. And in 2004, when Ivan was approaching the Gulf Coast, that was the second time I knew we didn't have a plan. It was kind of like this. It's exactly like that. And we mean that from the Board of Pharmacy perspective. Yeah, yeah, we were not, we did not have a plan. You know, we have, I mean, we have regulations in place that require uh, manufacturer, wholesaler, distributors to have disaster plans. When we go in and inspect a place, that they're supposed to be able to produce it. Yet, we come to work 
at the Board of Pharmacy. And now granted, we're not front line like a lot of you, you guys would be in a disaster. But we were, we were, we were handed a flashlight, rechargeable, mind you, and a case of bottle of water, and and told told to, told to head to the coast. Yeah, head to the coast. Are you are you serious? What? Where where are we supposed to stay? There's, there aren't going to be any hotels. Where? I don't know. You, you just have to figure it out. We don't have. We didn't have a plan. We had, we said what happens to communication? Cell cell phones will be down. Yeah. We won't be able to communicate. No cell phones. No ability to get fuel for our vehicles. Right. We hadn't we worked out anything with the there. Department of Transportation. So that was rethought real quickly, and so we ended up going. Uh, uh, four days later, and I was working this area at that time, and I was I was going because Orange Beach and of course was hit very hard with Ivan. Um, you know we had several pharmacies down there that were that were des destroyed. You know I was down there with the National Guard, and you know they were helping. The corporate had gotten some assistance from the chains. The independents were working. Uh, to try to gather the drugs that were literally out in the streets and trying to trying to secure all that you know the National Guard and the state police had everything pretty much secured but uh, but that was uh, that was uh, that was a situation where we had had um, had to follow up on but 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 um, it takes a lot of coordination. I know you people with the EMA, you do that. I know you're 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 very good at it, and um, and but that's that's something that that uh, takes a lot of coordination uh, uh, with uh, all the parties involved, first responders, the the uh, National Guard, and and and, and the EMA. <clears throat> but um, you know. You know, we had just like the trailer that you have that Nancy has outside. You know, we had situations where, um, you know, after after Ivan, we had tornadoes that occurred down in the south part of the state. I uh, had a pharmacy in Flemington, uh, which I'm sure several of you are familiar with that, close to the close to the Florida line, uh, close to Atmore. You know, the roof of that pharmacy was completely ripped off. Um, you had. Uh, a couple of chains that were completely um, d destroyed. They had to bring in temporary uh, pharmacy. We uh, we approved the temporary pharmacies. Um, we, we had requirements on what they had to do with those temporary pharmacies and how they had to secure those those temporary pharmacies. Um, uh, the uh, uh, tornado of um, of. And we had the same thing happen during Katrina. We had over here in Mobile, you know, the streets were flooded. You know, the, it, it totally destroyed some some um, medications in some of the pharmacies. They had to bring in a temporary pharmacy, um, and, and we have to actually go and approve those before they could actually get them operational. Which means we got to get down there pretty quick because as soon as they are able to get it in there. You know they need to be approved to be able to start functioning, to provide the medications for the patients. Uh, the the um, 2011, April 27, 2011 tornado. Um, we got a phone call, all of us that were working that area, because I was then working Central Alabama. My partner Mark Delk was also working uh, Central Alabama with me. Um, we um, were called by our supervisor at the time. Uh, hey, there's bad storms coming. You need to take shelter somewhere. So I knew I knew Mark, my partner, was had had uh, said he was going to Tuscaloosa that day. So so I'd gotten I was I was checking the weather and I was listening to uh, the weather forecast on the on the radio and and so I called him. I said, Hey, where are you? He said, oh, I'm in a wall. I'm, no, I'm in a CVS. Uh, in Tuscaloosa. Maybe I wasn't telling where he was at. Well, you know, 
you have to. But anyway, <laughs> so so Mark, uh, I told him, I said, man, there's a, there's a tornado coming straight toward Tuscaloosa. You need to get out of there. And um, he left. He left. Twenty minutes later, the tornado hits along 15th Street, goes straight down 15th Street to uh, uh, McFarland, and that CVS that he was just in uh, was totally destroyed except for the very back corner where the pharmacy was. All the employees were able to rush to that part of the pharmacy to take shelter, and, and uh, it's a miracle nobody was hurt. But, um, but we, we had to assist um, and coordinate with the corporate of, uh, of CVS, with the, uh, with the uh, state police, because we had to get, if anybody was involved in that at all, you know how bad it was, all the debris, you know, you know the first responders were responding out there. Um, they were having flat tires because there were so many nail and metal and all that that they couldn't, you know, they, their vehicles got stranded. So we had to coordinate to get that temporary trailer in uh, to that location to uh, allow them to be up and running because, as everybody knows, how devastating that, that was. And, and like was mentioned earlier, you know, when disaster hits, we're not going to sit on our high horse and say, no, you can't open that portable trailer up as a pharmacy until we get there. We look at everything as a whole. If it's where we can't get there, we're not going to make you wait until we can get there. You know, we'll, we'll we can work with with uh, the pharmacies, but when when it's permissible, when we can get there in a timely manner, then yes, we'll have you wait. Uh, a tornado hit Troy uh, Walmart a few years ago. I had to go uh, do that one, but we we make them. As Eddie mentioned, uh, have to meet certain requirements on those portable trailers. Um, as pharmacists, and again, this has been brought up, Rhonda touched on it, uh, pharmacists, you're very important. Uh, pharmacy technicians are very important. Um, your pharmacies are important to your local community. Um, but it, it you're important because it makes you a, a secondary source for emergency care when something happens when there is a disaster. Um, you provide patient assessments, triage patients, um, and even give emergency refills uh, when necessary. And that happened during Katrina. You know, we you know the governor signed that proclamation and allowing because we had that influx of people coming in from from uh, uh, Louisiana and Mississippi, you know, they didn't have prescriptions, you know, they didn't have, you know, so the uh, pharmacy were able to give medications to those people that needed medications. So, so those type of situations, like, like everyone has talked about the, the governor's proclamation on those type of things to, to help uh, the patients get the medications they need. Um, you know, we had, I mean, that, the, the, the the tornado that hit um, Tuscaloosa and then it came into Birmingham, hit Pratt City, uh, hit Pleasant Grove, if any of you are familiar with Jefferson County. I mean, it was a devastating, uh, devastating tornado. Um, and um, we, had, we had other tornadoes up in Hackleburg, up in North Alabama, that we had some damage, um, uh, damage of, 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 of pharmacies. There in Jefferson County, we had a health department clinic that was hit that was damaged, that had a pharmacy in it. So, so there was a lot of, a lot of uh, things that affected the, those pharmacies and, and, the med and everyone, you know, first responders, the medical uh, community, and everything else. Yeah, you know, that, that tornado scared my wife so bad. You know, I had her convinced that, you know, dear, th that won't happen again for 100 years. And, um, and everybody knows it was April. 2011. Well, in January of 2012, which tornado in January, so a tornado comes through Jefferson County, clay, clay, trustful type area over there. Well, uh, the guy that does my pest control at my home, his house was devastated. 
him and his him and his wife. Uh, his wife got a phone call. They they rush to the basement. They get their daughter. The son had a base a, a bedroom in the basement. They get him, and he barely gets out of his bedroom, and a tornado hit. The door to this bedroom hit him and knocked him underneath his mother's SUV, and so he comes. He pull he, uh, Ken, who was my pest control guy. Ken crawls out from under the house, looks across the street, and he sees the roof to that house gone, turns around to look at his house, and the only thing that's left is the first floor. That was it. No, he was not. That happened, that happened down the street from his house. Um, no, he, he and his family were safe. Um, so my wife was there when he's telling me the story. And then I go online and look at it. So needless to say, that weekend I was in North Alabama buying a storm shelter. I could have sworn that was it. And we're on the uh, slides. I said, how'd you get in my basement? <laughs> so, but uh, I accused him of having Rhonda over for yeah, cocktails she, or something. Yeah, she, she <laughs> so. So those things, uh, you know, I mean, it made a lot of people think about being uh, ready for, for a disaster situation. Of course, of course, I told the guy I bought that from, I said, you know, that cost more than the first new car I ever bought. So I just want you to know. Which was a 1978 Firebird Formula. I love that car. <laughs> there we go down memory lane. Okay, I'll be quiet. Uh, again, plan, plan, plan. Can't emphasize that enough. Um, pharmacies are very important. Uh, serve a, a, a very valuable purpose. Uh, and, and this is day to day, so you can imagine the people that uh, rely on the pharmacies uh, when, when a disaster hits, uh, just being amongst you know, losing everything and then they can't get their life-sustaining medication. Me, myself, I'm on two different insulins. I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't. I don't know. I'd, I'd be, fortunately, I know a few pharmacists. Maybe I could lay hands on some, but uh, nonetheless. Within the law. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, in fact, I owe her some insulin. But I some, my, well, my doctor changed me, and I'd already had one filled. And her, one of her pets is on insulin, so I told her she could have what you know. Uh, so Robin's giving you her pets and no, drugs. No, I'm giving her. Uh oh. I think that's I thought nah, not for a pet. It's either that or throw it in the garbage. I'd rather let her get some use out of it. Uh, Talking about the drugs, so that's one of the things that we have to make sure of, you know, when damage is done at these locations, you know, that the drugs haven't been adulterated in any way, that, that the temperature controls and all of those things, they've been, they've been able to be stored in a place where, where they, they don't become um, uh, non-effective. And uh, so, so there's, a little, there's several things that we, we talk to the pharmacists about in those regards. And, and give them kind of some guidelines to try to help them, you know, to to do something to get it get it uh, taken care of right, as soon as as soon as possible. So, yeah, the, this this has been covered. Just know your risk, make a plan, and uh, know who you've got to fall back on. Who, your your employees, uh, local resources, law enforcement, EMS. Just can't stress it enough. But in identifying your risk, look to the security of your inventory. Again, back to the, the burglary aspect of it, which could carry over into your, your disaster planning. Uh, the safe. Uh, the safe probably going to help you as far as a flood goes, but uh, could save that inventory um, in the event of a tornado, something to that effect. Uh, Again, temperature control, unless you go out and buy a Ronda Lacey generator, you're, you're not going to have, you know, you, you, you could get a smaller one to, 
to pull your uh, refrigerator at least for your refrigerated uh, medications. Uh, know, know what you're going to do if your supply chain is interrupted. Um, because it, we're not just looking at what if the pharmacy is wiped out, what if your, your wholesale distributor is wiped out, what's your, what's your backup plan? And as Rhonda mentioned, the, the, the integrity of your, uh, your data uh, needs to be backed up. Your contacts, make sure you have uh, a good contact list. Uh, might want to consider an alternate meeting site uh, in the event Depending on the disaster, it's going to be um, a case-by-case -case basis, so to speak, but uh, have an alternate meeting site. These guys, again, have done a great job, I think, in, uh, in getting these uh, preparedness guidelines, information, uh, everything out. Um, and you've got your federal, which had some of those come and speak here. Um, and then others such as Red Cross. The quicker a pharmacy can get back up and running, the better. Normalcy, that's what people want when there's, when there's a crisis. Uh, and you know, Katrina was, uh, was an extreme disaster. It, it, was, a, it was a horrible uh, thing that happened there, but uh, that went on for, for quite a while. It, it took, it was, Heck, the last time I was there, Eddie, they still got buildings that haven't been, they've just been boarded up. Right. Uh, but normalcy, it's a, it's a new normal, but uh, people have returned. But I've actually got some people who fled from Louisiana, came here, got licensed as technicians, and they stayed here because they lost everything there. I put this in here because pharmacists, just law enforcement, we, we swear an oath that we're going to uphold the Constitution to the best of our abilities. Pharmacists take an oath to devote professional life to the service of all humankind through the profession of pharmacy. And I'm not saying, hey, I, you've got to be number one on that list of pharmacists to, to be called in the event of a, you know, that you've got to be on the, for the pods, but I think you should be, you know, at some point, be willing to serve on that or be, be willing to be called at some point. I mean, even if it's two years, I mean, go do the training, sign up, do two years, and uh, more likely than not, I would hope nothing would happen that would require being called out for that but um, it's just something to think about from from that perspective um, now when disasters do hit there, there's we really don't have any need to be on the front lines you guys are out there on the front lines um, but we are in communication I mean we do get right. communicated by the state uh, by the Department of Public Health you know by EMA sometimes uh, you know what you know? What what do we need to do? And we we got, try to guide and offer any uh, assistance that we can in that regard. But for us to be in the midst of a disaster, it's gonna, it's not doing anything. It's going to hinder you guys getting your jobs done. Um, we had the tornado hit. I live in Prattville. The tornado hit there uh, several years back, um, about two miles from my house. Uh, I was taking a nap Sunday afternoon. Didn't know it was a tornado. Launch sirens been going off all day, but at the time, supervisory wise, from the board, I was told, "Hey, you need to go down there and check on the pharmacies." I can't get down there. It, you know, I'm, I'm driving a a four door sedan. There's nails, glass, wood. I'm going to wind up with four flat tires, but I went. No, I didn't tell you to do that. Didn't, no, no. It no, what? But, uh, and, and there, were, there was nothing I could do but look at the carnage because the state, you guys, the first responders, the, those people were there. They were handling it. Um, we just, as Eddie said, we, 
We, we do have uh, our board members, uh, we've got our director, very, very competent people. They're all pharmacists. Uh, our law enforcement contacts, we're in communication with state and federal uh, officials, and we, we try to keep people updated. If, if there's a need for a pharmacist somewhere, uh, not necessarily in a catastrophic event where, where you need uh, ten, you know, hundred pharmacists, but we, there might we might have contacts enough to get a something filled, a need filled if necessary. And we may not be able to provide you uh, contact information for pharmacists, but we have the ability. We have a new software system. We have ability. We're, we're able to now uh, do by county uh, blast blast emails uh, through our software where we can. Uh, localize an area to contact them to let them know that you that that you need help. So, you know, just always keep that in mind. And just a list of resources uh, which you guys already know, and that's it. Okay, I got one last story. I'm not going to say anything else after that. So that storm room I bought. So I've got a 17 year old. And I've got, I raised my, my wife and I raised our granddaughters to, who was 16 years old. So ever since 2011, well, ever since 2012, when I got the storm room, talking about an emergency a response kit and all that, okay, well, I got the whole drill. I mean, I've got the box in, inside the storm room that's got all the equipment that we need. I've got batteries that I rotate out all the time. I've got water in there. So I make them go through the drill every time uh, uh, we get a tornado warning of, okay, you got to have shoes by your bed, you got to have um, something that, you know, if we have to crawl out of the house. And so every time they're going, you know, they're at their age, say, oh, my God, we've done this a hundred times. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, there's, there's, not, there's never enough training or never enough planning for those types of situations. You got generator envy, don't you? I'm telling you, that was a generator, wasn't it? Mm, thank you very much. Any, 